honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. The moderator of the first, first keynote presentation is Professor Datuk Dr. Faizal Rafi Muhammad Adikan, the Vice Chancellor of University of Science Malaysia. Professor Datuk Dr. Faizal Rafi Muhammad Adikan is currently the eighth Vice Chancellor of University of Science Malaysia and the second man from University of Malaya. Prior to his VC ship, he served as University of Malaya's Deputy Vice Chancellor of Development for almost three years, for almost three terms, sorry, from 2013 to 2019. Prof. Dato Rafi has served in numerous national level committees, including Economic Planning Unit, EPU. He has been a speaker and panelist in numerous platforms, including those organized by Higher Learning Leadership Academy or ACAP under the Ministry of Higher Education. In October 2015, Professor Dato Rafiq was appointed as Executive Director of UN Holdings in Emberhad, University of Malaya's Business and Investment Arm, making him UM Holdings' first Executive Director while still holding a Deputy Vice Chancellor's position. Prof. Dato Rafiq was made MRSM Typing Icon for 2020-2021, MRSM being its alma mater. Prof. Dato Rafiq received his PhD from the Opto Electronics Research Center, University of Southampton in 2007, specializing in glass-based integrated optical devices for use in telecommunication and sensing applications. He has published more than 100 peer-reviewed journals and conference papers on optics and engineering education. His integrated lightwave research group, which he started, currently runs an optical fiber fabrication tower. His flat fiber pattern was the winner of the Google Award, the best for physical sciences and engineering, and the best of the best top prize during University of Malaya Research, Invention and Innovation Expo 2009. His research work on corrosion sensing appeared in the March 2013 issue of a reputable international technical magazine called Optics and Photonics News. His group also picked up the top prize as Malaysia Science Academy's Innovation Award during the Dr. Faisal Rafiq Muhammad Adikar. Thank you, Azrael, for the kind introduction. Well, I'm uh, honoured today to be introducing our first keynote speaker, Emeritus Professor George Scott. Uh, professor Scott is the uh, Emeritus Professor of Higher Education and Sustainability at Western Sydney University, Australia. For, for eight years, he was Pro Vice Chancellor of Quality and Executive Director of Sustainability at WSU. During this time, he led a range of successful external quality audits and established the UN endorsed Regional Centre of Expertise in Education for Sustainable Development at WSU. In the 2020 Times Higher Education Impact Rank Ratings on Sustainability in Higher Education, WSU was ranked third in the world, and I'm pretty sure that Prof. Scott played a major role in that. Congratulations, Prof. Uh, he is a widely uh, published author of reports and articles on change leadership, sustainability, social entrepreneurship, professional capability, what distinguishes successful early grad career graduates in a wide range of professions, Assuring Achievement Standards and Quality Assurance in Higher Education. His book, Turnaround Leadership for Higher Education with Canada's uh, Michael Fullen, which was published in 2009, received the U.S. College's Bellwether Award and his international study of successful change leaders of education for sustainable development. Turnaround Leadership for Sustainability in Higher Education is widely used around the world. Currently, Professor Scott is working with universities and colleges in Europe, the UK, East Asia, Australia, and New Zealand, and how best to embed UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals into the curriculum. In that sense, uh, USM is uh, uh, honored, and uh, you know we, we are following suit as well. Now, his talk today is uh, titled "The COVID-19 Aftermath: What the Future Holds for Higher Education in a Disruptive Epoch," and this will pay particular attention to current initiatives around the world to build social enterprise capstones, addressing the SDGs and capstones on the key dilemmas of early career professional practice into the higher education curriculum. 
Uh, before I pass this to Professor Scott, we will be taking questions and I shall attempt to summarize them into some uh, thematic areas uh, uh, proposed to Professor Scott. Uh, we have 55 minutes for this session and uh, without further ado, I'll pass this session to Professor Scott. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you, everyone. It's just terrific to be here with you. Um, so I'll, put, I'll talk for about 35 minutes and then, as we just said, we'll take some questions uh, at the end. Um, uh, these slides, I'm going to go through them quite quickly. Um, they're in reasonable detail, but I wanted to give you the sense of what's on the slides because, in a sense, after the session, you could utilise them as a, an aid memoir to some of the points that I've said. Um, secondly, I'll, uh, at the very end of the slides, I've actually given some references. Uh, much of what I'm going to be saying today is coming out in a chapter in a forthcoming book, um, which I'll give you the reference to. Um, so you, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that uh, this is just to give you an overview, really, of what I've been doing around the world over the past decade, really, in terms of building the sustainable development goals into the curriculum of universities, but also working out w to what extent have we been training people for the last t uh, 20 years and not the next 20 years in our universities? In other words, um, have we just been looking at making them work ready for today or have we actually been developing up our graduates so that they're work ready plus for an uncertain and disruptive tomorrow? And that's why that the topic uh, for today, I think, is so apposite. And I was very happy to take up the invitation to talk about this work. So with no further ado, I'll just um, see if I can bring up my slides for us now. And uh, hopefully that's come up for us all right. I'll just get them to go. So uh, hopefully that's, is that, uh, is that coming through okay? It's fine. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. okay. So I'm just going to first of all just quickly go through some of the key points um, just as a summary for you and then I'll just expand on each of those as we go through the talk for you. So the first thing that COVID is certainly a wicked problem for today um, and it, you know it, it is just emblematic of the age of uncertainty that we're in. We've always been in, in ages of uncertainty, but it's become far more um, dramatic now um, because, uh, of, amongst other things, because of technology and connectedness and speed. Um, so we really need to be looking at what our universities are doing to develop people up to manage wicked problems like COVID. COVID's not the, the only one. They're going to keep coming. Uh, the second thing is COVID triggers us to reflect on the tacit assumptions and values that we've been actually operating under in the 21st century agenda. Uh, the third thing is that values drive engagement and implementation. People will not engage with change unless they see it as valuable to them. And valuable to them means that they see it as relevant, desirable, in other words, ethically decent, relevant, desirable, clear, and most importantly, feasible. Uh, the, the fourth thing that I'm going to talk briefly about is the fact that the sustainable development goals are not independent of each other. They all have to be dealt with concurrently and, and in a moment I'll be talking and showing uh, how, you, how all of those SDGs need to be addressed when we're trying to tackle a wicked problem like COVID-19. Uh, uh, the next point that I'm going to be making is that uh, it, universities are critical to implementing the SDGs and they're critical, as we've seen, to tackling COVID. It was graduates of universities that came up with the vaccines that are currently underway. It did not happen spontaneously out there just in the ether. So universities are actually critical to managing the age of uncertainty and the age of disruption. And therefore, we've got to look very carefully at just what capabilities we're building into our graduates in our universities. And I'll be sharing with you some of the research that I did with 3,700 learning and teaching leaders around the world for the Australian government on how to develop Work Ready Plus graduates. Um, at the moment, there's a site for that called the, face, uh, called the Flip Curric site, which I'll give you a reference to later, which is the, currently being used by 17,500 higher education groups around the world to review their curricula to develop Work Ready Plus graduates to handle this age of uncertainty that's emblematic uh, of the COVID-type wicked problems. Um, so work ready plus graduates are critical. We need work ready graduates for today. That means people who are competent and capable to deliver set skills and knowledge under set conditions, predictable conditions. But we need work ready plus graduates for people who can manage uncertain and disruptive conditions that are unpredicted. 
So we need both, not just one. You, you need competence, of course, but you also need capability. Um, and there are courses now that uh, I think we need to, that I'll talk to you about that are now being un implemented around the world to develop work ready plus outcomes. Um, and really, I suppose, in a sense, embedded in my talk today is the idea that good ideas with no ideas on how to implement them are always wasted ideas. Um, and I'm going to finish off by quickly summarising some of the characteristics that, I, that the people I've worked with around the world, the 17,500 higher educators, what we think the new university might look like for this new age, this age of uncertainty and disruption. Uh, and I'll just quickly allude to a few myths. So I'm going to now have to move fairly quickly through the slides, but hopefully that's the overview. That's the key points there. You've got those. So I'll now go through those in a bit of detail. My final point is that everything I'm going to say today links directly to the panel discussions. If you look at those panel discussions, you've got people talking about agile, future-ready graduates. I've just talked about uh, what we've been doing on that. Resilient entrepreneurs, particularly social entrepreneurs, who can tackle the, the sustainable development goals. We need a future-ready curriculum and we need an appropriate role for information and communications technology, but always as part of a broader learning system. So that's the overview. Now I'm going to go quickly through these slides. So never waste a crisis. COVID gets us to reflect on our values. Um, it's a wicked problem. Um, it raises ethical dilemmas for us. Uh, they, and we, we really need graduates to be looking at the ethical dile dilemmas of, of professional work, whether it's in engineering or medicine or accounting. It doesn't matter. There are always ethical dilemmas. And in COVID, of course, we've got one the example is lives versus livelihoods, and you'll see that all around the world as we know, people talking about saving lives versus saving the economy. And that raises very delicate uh, dance between how do you balance the two. Um, and every sustainable development goals needs to be addressed to, to actually tackle issues like COVID. And as I've said, if you look at the nature of how poverty means that large numbers of people have to live together in dense things. They have to go out every day just to get a job. They can't just stay locked down in, in, in a country like mine. Um, that they're often forced to go out. We've got health and wellbeing, education to educate people about uh, the pros and cons of taking vaccines. You can see each of those, every single one of those, right down to things like life below the water. People throwing away now these disposable masks we have to wear. That gets into the, the, the sewerage system and gets out into the waters and, and adds to the plastic in, in the water. So some of these things are not as directly obvious as others, but they are all have to be dealt with concurrently if we're going to be tackling COVID. And that is why it's such a wicked problem. But it's also why those sustainable development goals are so important, because in a sense they create a moral purpose for higher education. And this is really what higher education is now needing to think about for the future, is returning to its moral purpose and thinking really about what it's been taken for granted in terms of where it's got itself to uh, in, in, our, in our world. You know, is it just a business? Is it all just about making money? Or is it about something else? And if so, what might that be? And we believe that the Sustainable Development Goals do provide a set of, if you like, moral guidelines about what we might be trying to do to make a better world. Um, and that's why these values are so important. Every single technical, uh, social, political decision is value laden. When people have to make a decision about what to do when you've got two options, values come to bear. Therefore, it would be so important in our view for every graduate to be clear on their values before they graduate. What do they stand for? Have they thought about the 21st century agenda, the, the tacit assumptions that are driving it? Things like growth is always good for everyone, consumption's happiness, information technology is always the answer, things like that. These are, these are value issues that at the moment in higher education are not always given enough emphasis. Um, and I'll just list it out there, some of the values that people have talked about that underpin the sustainable development goals. It is a good thing not to have poverty or hunger. It is good for everyone to have a decent, healthy life. It's good for everyone to have access to quality education. It's good for us to care for our environment and to live harmoniously. And it's good to have a world where we're constantly saying, why don't we, not why don't you? Now, they are values, and values are always arguable. But they are values that I think people should be working out their position on as part of the new university. 
Um, and this, of course, has links to the world's religions, but it also links to the, the research that we've been doing for the last 25 years now on what distinguishes successful early career graduates. They all overlap, these things overlap. You know, having compassion, kindness for others, humility, calmness, honesty, authenticity, etc. You can see them listed there. Being willing to face and learn from your errors. These are embedded value judgments about how to live. And as education and higher education is creating the inventors for tomorrow, it would be kind of nice in our view for them to be clear on their values when they have to take a decision about whether to put their efforts into option A or option B when they're actually looking at um, taking decisions and taking scientific projects on. And as J uh, Kofi Annan said many, many years ago, more than a decade ago, you know, we must stress the basic values that are common to all the world's religions. And that, there they are. And they are very similar to the ones I've just listed. So now, I've already mentioned that higher education is critical to dealing with the age of uncertainty and it's critical to implementing the sustainable development goals. I've already mentioned how it's the, it creates the world, many, most of the world's leaders, entrepreneurs and scientists. It can shape values of people as it does that. People learn the values as they, learn, as they are getting assessed. Assessment actually has values embedded in it. Uh, we know that all, as all change is learning, then higher education is a learning place. Therefore, we need to actually focus on our, what learning creates, graduates able to manage the, the age of disruption and uncertainty and to implement the Sustainable Development Goals and to be critically uh, aware of the pros and cons of information and communications technology. Um, so, as I've said, the university needs to focus on competence, not just uh, on capability, uh, work ready plus for the future, not just competence, work ready for today. And information tech and communications technology is just one of 60 learning methods. Uh, I did a big research project a number of years ago with a million comments on the National Course Experience Questionnaire down here, uh, where we identified 60 key learning methods that students like to engage in learning. Fundamental to that learning process to is to understand that learning is a profoundly social experience. It's not just a technological experience. Now. Uh, what is a Work Ready Plus graduate? Um, work Ready Plus graduates are sustainability literate. In other words, they understand uh, the sustainable development goals and what they might be doing in their own professions and lives about addressing them. They are change implementation savvy. They can actually take good ideas and actually make them happen. This is all the, these are the things that should be seen as highlighted in the curriculum and assessment. They should be inventive socially, not just commercially, and that's why we're now building social enterprise capstones into the curriculum in universities around the world, focused on the sustainable development goals. Uh, and they need a clear position on the tacit assumptions driving the 21st century agenda, and I've already mentioned those to you. And it's important to know that individuals like organisations and societies, we're all tested when things go awry or the unexpected happens, like wicked problems like COVID. We're not that tested when things run predictably. Therefore, we should be equipping our graduates to understand that that's what life's like, but to be able to manage it with calmness and to be able to manage it uh, ethically. And this, in our view, is what needs to be underpinning the characteristics of a university for the future, not the past. This is a, the studies that we've done on successful early career graduates. This is a validated professional capability framework and I won't go through this in detail, it's there for you, and there's plenty to read about that on the flip curric side if you're interested. But I will mention the capability subscales because they're important and they are embedded in them. They have the values that we should be developing in our graduates. Self-awareness and regulation, the ability to remain calm when things go wrong. Decisiveness, the ability to take a hard decision. And to do that, you have to understand your values. The ability to be committed, in other words, caring about what you do, caring about others, wanting to do a good job. Interpersonal capabilities, how to influence people, particularly those that don't agree with you. And that, of course, is, is a clear set of capabilities at the moment for those who are, uh, who are, who are anti-vaxxers, for example. And you're seeing it underplaying, underplaying in, before everyone around the world in terms of what's happening currently in some of the states in the USA. 
um, empathising with people. In order to influence, you must empathise, which means you've got to be in their shoes, not in your shoes. And the three key cognitive capabilities is the ability not to problem solve, but to work out what the problem is and whether it's worth paying attention to. And secondly, to be able to work out how to implement that, to think strategically forwards in terms like a chess player. If I did that, what would happen as opposed to if I did that? And thirdly, being able to actually manage things once you're implementing it, often you have to adjust as you go along. It's not like you have the plan and it all works out the way you predict it. So those capability subscales underpin what I've said already about the age of uncertainty uh, and managing it. These are operational ways of doing it. And then, as I'll talk in a moment, there are a whole series of curriculum developments we've undertaken around the world to enact that agenda. Now, I won't uh, go through these, except these are there for you to look at later. These are the top ranking capabilities for successful graduates in nine professions that we've undertaken over the last 25 years. I've just aggregated them all up out of, out of nine different professions, running from medicine to journalism to engineering uh, to uh, teaching, um, you know, pretty well all of the professions. You'll see embedded that where you see the P's, they're personal capabilities. Where you see the IPs, they're interpersonal. And where you see the C's, they are cognitive capabilities. They do not, when graduates talk about why they were selected as being so effective as a, in their early career, they don't talk just about the skills and knowledge they've got, they talk about the things like they're enlisted in that, in that chart there for you. And we thought we asked in employers. So we asked 147 employers in Western Sydney what they were looking for in successful early career graduates. They came up with the same things. And the thing is, those 147 employers work in, a, in the most multicultural area in Australia. We have 172 different countries living domestically in Western Sydney. So this is not just, if, if you like, Anglo cultural uh, identifiers. These appear to operate across cultures. And that's no surprise because they have overlaps, of course, with the world's religions, which has overlaps also with what we know leads to harmonious and productive countries and organisations. So you need those skills and knowledge, but they're always underneath the ones above. The ones above are capabilities for tomorrow. The ones underneath are the skills and knowledge you need now to do a decent job. Now, I've got about sort of about 10 minutes to go, I think, before we go to questions. Um, so I'll just keep now moving to the next section. I mentioned that if we want Work Ready Plus graduates for an uncertain and disruptive future where people are able to manage wicked problems like COVID, then what we need is in the curriculum direct attention to those Work Ready Plus capabilities I just outlined for you on the previous slide. And there are two things that, two initiatives that are underway around the world that graduates are loving and uh, we're finding in, uh, particularly effective in preparing them for an uncertain future. The first is social enterprise capstones focused on the sustainable development goals. This is where groups of students get together and work with their local region, looking at the sustainable development challenges in that region and look at solutions for that. The second are capstones focused on the key dilemmas of early career professional practice. So in New Zealand, for example, We've just set up a whole curriculum. We did a whole research project on engineers, successful early engineers. We've discovered all of the dilemmas they face in their first five years of practice. We then have implemented a capstone called Dilemmas of Early Career Practice in Engineering, where you actually come to, to confront the wicked problems. You come, become comfortable with the wicked problems uh, that you're going to have to confront. Uh, and you actually start to look at what successful graduates did to resolve them always around the idea of they were caught in a fork road situation, they had to take hard decisions, and those personal capabilities, that, that ability to take a hard decision, gets illustrated through real world practice, not through theory, but from successful early career graduates telling those behind them, here's what you're going to face. And of course, to evaluate that, we've got the key capabilities that I've just outlined in the previous slides. So you don't just randomly evaluate how students deal with the capstone, You've got, did they, were they able to remain calm when things went wrong? Were they able to work productively with the diversity in the situation or not? Were they able to diagnose what was going on? These are the capabilities that are important. This is what we should be assessing. Um, 
Now, I want to say a couple of words about information and communications, communications technology. Those one million comments we evaluated, uh, we haven't uh, done it in uh, Southeast Asia, but it would be very interesting to do it there. What we found there is what students want for the use of information and communications technology, and I'm the chair of a number of boards at the moment where we're actually dealing with COVID very rapidly in a move to information and communications technology. So we've asked our students, what are they like uh, that we'd be doing for them with, under COVID? They want an interactive, just in time, just for me learning, simulations, trigger situations, collaborative action projects, practicing set skills offline, away from us. They can do the set skills and they, the doctors that we're working with can practice how to read um, mammography charts offline with a little app. They don't have to do that as part of a, an intensive classroom testing situation. So those are the, the key act, interactive uh, ways of using ICT as part of a broader learning system. Um, making it happen, I'm just going to then move, I think I've got about another five, five, set, five to ten minutes. Um, Actually, Prof, you have about, about ten minutes. Excellent. So you, yeah, okay. I take your time. Yeah. What I've been talking about so far, everyone, is maybe what might be a good idea for developing a Work Ready Plus university for an uncertain future, right? Now, and this, remember, is based on the 17,500 people I've been working with around the world, so it's not just made up, if you like, in theory. But that might be a good idea. It might not. You might, not th you might think that what I'm talking about is rubbish, in which case you will not engage with it because you will have made a value judgment. If you think it has value, then the issue is what do you do on Monday to enact it? And that's that whole research that was mentioned earlier that I've been doing for um, basically since the 1970s, which is how do you actually make change work? You can have good ideas, but if you don't know how to implement them, they're wasted ideas. And that's why we've written that book about turnaround leadership for higher education, because change will not just happen, it must be led, but deftly. And it's not just the vice chancellors or the deputy vice chancellors or the pro vice chancellors, it's the actual program managers that are key arbiters of whether change happens. And they, just like graduates, are making value judgments all the time. And we must understand that they are doing that. And we must understand the key tips from successful change leaders on how they took good ideas like building a change-ready university, like with the agenda that I've outlined earlier today. What do they do? Well, uh, we, the first thing is to recognise that you build the culture of the uni by the, the leaders modelling how to behave when things go wrong. And they are able to remain calm or not rain, remain calm. That builds the, way, the culture, which is how we do things around here. The capabilities of effective leaders, we would say, are, are similar to successful graduates. We're all human beings. And those same capabilities that distinguish successful career graduates we showed are the same capabilities that, that uh, distinguish effective higher ed leaders in the research I did for the Australian Government way back in 2008 with 500 successful leaders from vice chancellors to program managers. And there's a, the, there's a book there in the references if you're interested in that work that will outline that. But if I can summarise what good graduates do and I summarise what good higher ed leaders do, they always listen, link, leverage and then lead, always in that order, never in any other order. They listen first with an agenda for change to see who's going to engage with it and with an understanding of the values of those they're working with. They link together what most people um, see as relevant and feasible and doable. They then leverage by taking small groups to try it under controlled conditions and only after they've learnt by doing do they then lead. And that's exactly how we built up Western Sydney University to get become number three in the world in terms of the Times Higher Education Impact Ratings on the Sustainable Development Goals. This was my philosophy when I was leading it, to listen, link, leverage and then lead. Therefore, the first thing I did at the university was to do a stock take on what was already happening around the Sustainable Development Goals. Just as you could do a stock take in the universities uh, in Malaysia around what's happening with COVID, to engage people with COVID. And then you, from that, you then, to leverage, you take those that are doing interesting things and you get them to try out new things under controlled conditions. And the motto is always ready, fire, aim. Ready, we should try this. We think it's important morally to do it. Fire was tried under controlled conditions to see what works. And aim is what we found worked after doing it. This is very different from a culture that says ready, aim, 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 
aim, aim, have a committee, have lots of meetings, aim, aim. So therefore, the key cultural attribute that we've found in the universities that have been embracing the sustainable development goals in the curriculum, like the capstones on uh, social enterprise and the dilemma-based assessment, is they have a why don't we, not a why don't you culture. And moral purpose always engages people, which is why I've spent so much time talking about the values today. Uh, and those last ones there are there for you. Oh, the, the final thing I wanted to make is, together that making the happen checkpoints there, is how to operationally enact Sustainable Development Goal 17, which is the partnerships goal. And that we're finding that people are finding that checklist quite handy when they're looking at what are we going to do and enact the Sustainable Development Goals. And that, of course, is important for Sustainable Development Goal 17. So now, what's the new university? I've just got about five minutes to go. Is that OK? Yeah, yes. Okay. So this is just, in a way, a way of summary of uh, what I've said so far. So that the new university and college uh, gives a careful focus to validating the program level outcomes first. It's no good to have fantastic assessment that's carefully moderated and no one's cheating if what you're assessing is rubbish. So we have, must have the right outcomes first and that flip correct site, flip correct is flipping the curriculum on its head to make sure we've got the right work ready plus outcomes in place first whenever we're reviewing our programs or developing new ones before we start to map down to the, 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 uh, the assessment of the learning methods we're going to use and the units of study. And that's how we develop work ready plus graduates. So that's the first thing that, the, that I would argue is important for the new university. The second is to give transdisciplinary attention to the 17 sustainable development goals using things like social enterprise um, capstones focused on them where you've got to bring together the psychologists with the scientists, with the people. You know, it's no good having a lot of science if you don't understand how to engage people with it. Um, a, equal attention to social as well as commercial entrepreneurship, as I said. A shared moral purpose, much more emphasised, including things like a why don't we culture. And that means we've got to spend a lot more time at STEAM, not STEM. The A in STEAM is arts. The arts is all about values. The arts is about moral purpose. You, it's no good having science, technology, engineering and maths if you're not looking at is it being applied to that which is dealing with the right moral purpose. For example, with the sustainable development goals as a set of moral purposes. Therefore, we must be helping every student to consider where they stand on the 21st century assumptions driving the, the agenda. You know, is growth really good for everyone equally? Is consumption always happiness? Is information, information technology always the answer? You know, um, and things like that. Is growth always good? You know, or is globalisation, uniformity, global uniformity, good? These are these are assumptions. These are these, are, but they are implicit in driving the agenda, and they are value laden, obviously. Therefore, we need to focus on standards, not standardisation. And the standards actually comes from being locally responsive around the moral purpose. Not standardisation, not a standardised curriculum. So every one of the Malaysia's universities, for example, would be looking at how it relates to its own unique set of sustainable development challenges. And actually try to actually have students prepared to try and tackle those so that when they go out into, their, into the world as both citizens, but also as professionals, they are used to the idea of tackling wicked problems. And the universities themselves should be living laboratories. They should model and practice what they preach in, in, in their culture, but also in looking at how they manage the sustainable development goals. And I'm just going to finish off with what might be seen to be some emerging myths. Now, I'm being provocative here, but it's worth thinking about each of these. You know, one myth is information is learning. Information is just giving learning. So you can have all these MOOCs, but learning is changing the capabilities that you've got, the personal, interpersonal, and cognitive capabilities in a positive direction. That's learning. Information doesn't automatically uh, result in that. Teaching is learning is another myth. Another is learning is not a profoundly social experience. It is. We are social creatures. And uh, information technology is always the answer. It is fabulous. There's no doubt about it. Look at what we're trying to do today. We couldn't do it without it. But there's also downsides as well as upsides. And you know, you know all about social media and echo chambers, and you know, if you can start to see what was happening in uh, in January in the United States, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Uh, it's a myth, in our view, that, that higher education uh, is a cost, not an investment. It's an investment in your total social, cultural, intellectual uh, capital of your country. Um, and it's not, um, it's a myth that it's a sole purpose to produce work ready graduates for today. And I'll go down the, the rest of these, you can see them all. You know, change is not progress. Change is something becoming different. Progress is a value judgment that it's worthwhile. And that's why I've been talking about the moral purpose and the values thing so much today. Another myth, of course, which George Bernard Shaw said is that change is achieved by brute logic. And you see that very much in the challenges that are faced at the moment with people talking about climate change. Um, just talking about the science does not necessarily change those who are fixed. And consensus around the table, not around the data, the knight and the white charger, the, you know, that we just have one great person and it'll all change. Publicly humiliating people with rankings will make them improve. Rewarding individuals rather than teams. Competitions better than collaboration. You can see them there. There's nothing new in those. And they may or may not be in your view myths, but they are certainly those which are running around the world at the moment, which underpin the challenges that we all need to take into account when we're trying to build the new university for an uncertain future and an age of disruption and, a, uh, and an age of disruption where wicked problems like COVID actually become the challenge. And of course, the final one there is you see many universities, when they're not sure what to do, they'll restructure. So look, um, I'll, I'll leave you with that. There's the, there's the references I mentioned. The one at the very bottom there, the forthcoming one, is the, is the one I mentioned, which actually outlines what I've talked about today. Uh, and that's in uh, the series that we've been doing for Brill in Leiden over in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Um, and this one's called Shaping a Wise Future. So I hope that's been useful. I hope I haven't gone too much over time. And uh, it's been a, a delight to be invited to talk about our work around the world with you today. And I do hope that's helpful for you as, you, as the uh, Global Higher Education Forum proceeds with the rest of its, uh, its operations. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. That's, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. It's amazing because it's a compression of years of experience and engagement. There's a lot of wisdom in there. Um, and you've covered quite a lot of things. Uh, and I, I, I can relate to that. And this, you know, I'm, I'm uh, this October will be my second year as VC. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there's plenty to digest and plenty of things, you know, we have to, uh, uh, to do. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough balancing act. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's extremely difficult. And um, we have some, some very interesting questions here. Um, and I think it's, uh, this is, uh, I'm going to read to you the, the three questions that were posed. Um, and I think I'm just going to write them down as you go and then I won't forget them. Yep. Oh, sure. Um, uh, before that, I think in, in USM as well, when we have our, um, the, the school, um, annual performance uh, assessment. We've actually introduced uh, narratives on how the school has actually impacted uh, society or national agenda and how, how are the programs related to uh, SFDs, for example. It's trying to, to have that values uh, incorporated in how schools look at, at, at themselves. And uh, that's, uh, the, the aim is to not have one, uh, one size fit all kind of uh, assessment to all schools because USM, for example, it's a Comprehensive University, offering 69 programs from the sciences to non-sciences and hybrid, and yes, you know, trying to get everyone to, to, to agree on, on something of this nature is, is somewhat um, you know somewhat challenging to, to, to say the least. But anyway, so here's the question. One one question from Majid Rasimi is, he says among the proposed uh, capability dimensions, i.e., uh, personal, interpersonal, or cognitive, which of, of them is the most important capability? Dimension. Now that also ties in well with uh, the question by Doria Abdullah. She's asking, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have the, the values or ethics uh, turn, uh, but much of the emphasis of the syllabus syllabus is uh, cognitive uh, in nature, and uh, it's very uh, outcome based. Uh, you know, it's outcome based heavy, if you like, and and, and of course values and ethics have to be measured. Yeah. Yep. How, you know, how, do you, how do you go about doing that? And is there, is there any, uh, any proxy measurements? You know, uh, even for myself, if I'm VC and I say, you know, what, what values did our students pick up from the university after four years in the university? Is there a, 
a number or, or a grading system uh, you know to 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 to, uh, to fall back to and of course the third one is from uh, Usharani Balasingam uh, she's asking you know on the ratings uh, time higher education uh, ratings and other uh, existing rating system uh, what are your views on all these uh, the various uh, rating system and how does some of them perhaps uh, relate to uh, uh, strategic uh, sustainable uh, development so those are the three questions first to kick off our Q&A session mm. okay that's great so um well, they're all they're all classic questions. In fact, that we're grappling with in many places around the world. Uh, first of all, in terms of Majid and the capabilities, um, the, the personal and interpersonal capabilities are very that that are constantly rated as most important across all the professions for what it's worth. And it would be very interesting, by the way, to replicate some of these studies in Malaysia. You know what I mean? I, I've always thought, you know, that the more we can start to look at this across different cultural uh, and geographical situations, the, the the better it is for us. So. I would love if you're interested to do that. I'm just currently doing uh, a, another study in Canada on early career doctors. Um, you know, and the more we can get these going together, I think the better. So the ones that, Majid, the, the, the ones that constantly come out is being able to remain calm when things go wrong. That's the first one. In other words, the people, people do not like someone who blows up and screams and yells at them and blames them and runs around. It's the ability to actually tolerate ambiguity. And to, and to actually tolerate the ambi ambiguous moment and to do it in a way that is actually not putting people into attention, number one. Number two is um, the ability to listen to people uh, rather than to talk. And, you know, that's why I mentioned that listen, link, leverage and lead system. You know, that, that works very, very well. Uh, even if you've got firm ideas, you always need to listen to others to see whether your firm ideas are going to be engaged with by them. Uh, and the third one is being able to take a hard decision. And that's that issue that you, you, we were just talking about, which is, you know, you're always caught on the horns of a dilemma. And you're, you're, you're fine when things are running smoothly. It's only when things go wrong that we're really ever challenged in life. And that's where, you know, working out what you stand for and the hard decision, which is people knowing your values before the hard decision has to be taken. Uh, and that's, that, it's almost like setting up the criteria to say, guys, when I'm caught on the horns of a dilemma, it may be difficult for me to satisfy everyone. I'm going to do what you know my values are. And people love it. Uh, so that's the first one. In terms of the values um, and how you might assess the, the values, uh, it, 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 McMaster University, I've been working with that um, flipped curr curriculum. There's 200 examples of how to assess the values and stuff like that in it. But I'll give you one example, right? And this is what we're currently looking at in Canada with those early career doctors. So as a capstone, early uh, capstone, um, before they go out and uh, graduate, and uh, there's a capstone called um, Dilemmas of Early Career Practice as a General Practitioner. Right? These are general. And what they get is they're all sitting down with a computer in a, an exam room, and onto the screen um, comes a video of an actress acting out a real dilemma that an early career doctor has already given us, right? And a woman's sitting there, she's about 28, 29, she's sitting talking on her iPhone 12 to her husband, she's got two lovely little kids, and she says, darling, I've got everything ready for dinner tonight, I'm coming home, I've got the kids, I'm just getting my mammography results now. They then cut, all, all 120 fledgling doctors sit there, and on their screen comes up the mammography results uh, and the bloods. They have to, this is skill and knowledge, this is correct skill and knowledge. They have to diagnose whether this woman's okay or not in terms of breast cancer. Now, in fact, she's, she's got secondaries, it's bad, bad, bad news. So the, they send off to the server their diagnosis first. Remember what I was talking about? Then, however, they say, she's walking through the door now, break the news to her. So suddenly it moves from science into work ready plus where she's got to break the news, the, the people have to read her and match. And then they, they, they say what they would do, that goes off to the server, then they get to see what the actual doctor did, who came up with the dilemma. They then have to write an essay on how well they manage the news compared to the doctors using the top 12 capabilities for successful early career doctors to analyse how well they went. Do you understand? Make sense? So th this is all doable. Now, they're, they're exactly in engineering. We've got the same ones. Killer moments in engineering. You know, um, 
uh, we've got them across every profession. And if you're interested in that, the Flip Correct site has on the home page, it's got a search button up on the top bar where you can search for ex exemplars of dilemma-based assessment. So that's, how, that's one way we believe that's doable and is scalable because of, remember I mentioned the, using the technology? It's scalable ways of putting people into wicked moments. Remember we've, our whole topic is about wicked problems, isn't it? Yep. Well, that, that's a wicked problem. So you've got to learn that before you go out, not when you get out, in our view. Um, and then the third one, you're talking about the Times Higher Ed Impact ratings and rankings. There's no doubt that rankings, I think, can lead to all sorts of perverse behaviours. Um, but that can also be utilised if you've got... If, 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 it, they can be utilised for a moral purpose in, in a funny way. So, for example, Barney Glover, who's the, the Vice Chancellor of Western Sydney University, when we put in for the Times Higher Ed Impact rankings, and we did really well, then as Vice Chancellor, the, the Vice Barney sees that as actually something efficacious in terms of his accountabilities. So, you know, there, there's multiple ways of engaging people with, with morally robust change. and. The, the moral purpose of the sustainable development goals. And in that sense, the Times Higher Impact ratings were certainly helpful for, I think, us at Western Sydney University to get senior executive support. Um, but you've always got to be wary of it because people can game it. And it's all, always an issue also of wealth and disparity and inequity. You know, the, 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 often the people who don't get up uh, don't actually have the money, but they're doing far more per capita, is, in a sense, for the dollars they've got, you know, the ringgits they've got, um, than you would uh, than you would expect in a country that's got a lot of money. Um, so that times I, the, of, I'm very wary of the perverse nature of rankings, but at, in certain cases they can be helpful. Thank you, Professor. So I'm guessing you know you have to be pragmatic in that sense. You, whether that is you know, positively applicable to your institution or not. Mm. Uh, uh, but you mentioned this uh, uh, this dilemma of uh, questions. Uh, I think you know it's, the, it's pretty much to gauge people's values. Mm -hmm. It's like that classic uh, you know train that will you know it's about to hit five people or you have the chance to divert that and hit you know, right. one person. And you know that's classic yeah. dilemma uh, question always posed in lots of uh, classes as well. Uh, and I think we we in, in the USA we're trying to develop this social progress uh, impact assessment to see you know what we do to the society can have a, an important ah. impact we have. So yeah. So we have two more questions here. Yeah? One yeah. from DAR, I think it's, that is the, the acronym for Tansri Zul Raza. I think he's tuning in perhaps that's, that's uh, in honour of what we have Tansri with us, if that is true. Uh, mm -hmm. He's asking, please comment on the issue of universities' closure as a strategy in dealing with the uh, disruptions. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question from Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahman, his question is, Teaching students how to fish rather than give them the fish. Can this be achieved in the present information technology and communications development as part of a sustainable goal? Okay, yeah. So this is, so I'm tied, I mean, the, uh, tied up with the closure of the universities and information and communications technology issue that suddenly universities had to, those who were not doing an enormous amount suddenly had to jump into. Um, there, there's, there's a, the, those, those mechanisms that I listed in one of the slides there is a check set of quality checkpoints for are we doing the following. Um, and certainly in Australia, there's a, there's a group called the Australian Council of Open and Distance Ed, uh, Education, which I run um, amongst others, leadership, the leadership training for, where we actually have a clearinghouse of good ideas. So, you know, I think in terms of, of the, 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 the closing of, if I understand the question correctly, if you're closing the university down as a result of COVID, then you know there are there's the issue of how do you maintain social interaction with people and you know there are certainly groups around the world that actually are looking up what efficacious ways to engage people when they uh, when they're actually having to do it online in the meantime and you know hopefully uh, once we all get vaccination working for the countries and we get hopefully to a better state of herd immunity we'll get back to the social interaction that really underpins you know profound learning um, but with information technology always having a role. So that's the first one. The second one in terms of um, teaching uh, students to uh, fish rather than giving them the fish, you know, that really raises something which we don't have much time to talk about now. And that's the issue of, of there being much more focused, there being a unit of study or a capstone unit even 
on information technology in the current age. And that raises issues around the sustainable development goals around digital equity, for example. Like we're finding here here in Australia, which is a first world country, we're finding now where all the schools are closed, we're finding the kids that are missing out are the ones who are living in crowded conditions in the suburbs of Western Sydney, where people don't have much money, they don't have good internet access, they don't have any devices at home, and yet they're doing home study. So the inequity breeds greater inequity. And that's a moral purpose value issue, which is actually an issue that relates to when we are training our graduates at universities, some of those are going to go off and become politicians and they need to actually somehow or other take with them that idea that those wicked problems like that, then the idea of having a moral purpose about looking at decreasing digital inequity rather than increasing it. Um, uh, so, you know, I suppose you can see the theme of what I'm getting at here. You know, I think it is doable for us to look at values and, and to look at personal interpersonal capabilities. We can learn them provided we're focusing on them and we can evaluate them given the master model I gave. You know, the, you know, you can evaluate these things and the more we can work on this together, the better, you know, across our countries, to our countries. You know, the more we do some successful early career graduate ones and look at dilemmas and then look at capstones and do some ready, fire, aim, small little trial, um, you know, wins with students, you know, let's get a bunch of students just to have a look at it and to say what they think, you know, so we co-create stuff together with our students without over committing first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like that, that, that final part because um, we, we are also doing our sort of uh, our version of ready, fire and aim. 70% uh, mm. of our, our students are from the uh, household with uh, who earns you know, in a, in a, in the bottom 40, 70 percent of them, and so we are, we grapple with the um, the challenge of do we, do you do you actually bring a, a, a sort of like a weak student to become good in the four years that they are here, or do you go from good to great? Given the the, the various uh, uh, social community background, and as you mentioned just now, there's uh, there's this uh, there's this divide, this digital divide, if you like. And so we are actually doing uh, uh, experimenting with a program called Life, where we we feed students with genomics and gerontology because you know they, they need to have compassion for all, mm -hmm. all those things, um, financial literacy, um, um, computational and uh, design thinking, Greek mm -hmm. philosophy as well. So we, we were actually piloting this to see if we can have uh, a, a similar introduction to the university from people from all respects of life, if you like. Now, so we have uh, more questions here, uh, Prof. Um, I think we have uh, enough time to entertain these questions. Um, uh, the, the first question is, uh, what is your view about integrating ed education into society instead of separating them as education sector and social sector? Um, mm -hmm. And then the second one is uh, thoughts on uh, students uh, with uh, disabilities, mm -hmm. which is often, over, uh, often overlooked segment in the university com uh, community. You know, how, do, how do you prepare them for a disruptive and uncertain tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And the third one, uh, this was from Magdalene. Uh, the third one is from uh, one uh, Suhaimi. Uh, what is your view about public intellectual notion for university lecturers? Okay. 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 Yeah. Yep. yep. Well, um, and these are all excellent questions, by the way, everyone. So, uh, and I think you know this is setting you up for the for the rest of your discussions, actually, <laughs> over the rest of the forum. Um, so taking education into society, many years ago in 1977, I set up in New South Wales a project called the Outreach Project uh, for technical and further education, where we were very concerned with um, people who had left school early, who didn't think they had any right to do any education. Um, and we went out and with community groups, we actually set up, and this this was done by, by New South Wales Technical and Further Education, but it could also be done by universities where you literally go out and you set up, you talk to community contacts and you talk to the community contacts who are working with groups who would not normally see themselves as having a right to go to do any post-secondary education at all. And you say, look, we just want to start humbly. We're not doing this for credit, but if there's anything you want to learn and you can get a group of 12 together, let me know as the outreach coordinator and we'll see if we can take some resources out for you to, to do that learning that you're interested in at a time and location that suits you. Now, that was incredibly successful. That ended up bringing 90,000 adults 
back into education who didn't think they had a right to learn because going out, it's a bit like the vaccination problem. Telling people to come in to get vaccinated is very different from going out to them on their home territory, understanding their culture and where they're at, and starting with them where they're at in order them to start to develop a personal relationship with you. So that notion of outreach, I think, I commend. The Enactus 2030, if you haven't seen that site, I'd really commend everyone to look at it. The Enactus 2030 site, Enactus is the group that works with 75,000 students around the world in universities going out to do community projects focused on their sustainable development goals. If you just put Enactus 2030 into your search engine, you'll see hundreds of projects where students have gone out to do work around the world. And one of the references I gave you in my, um, uh, in my slides there, the one for the Envacoco, um, which is the uh, European Journal of Sustainability, uh, is on social entrepreneurship, outlines many of those projects. So that outreach notion, going out rather than telling people to come in, uh, but starting with the idea of community education actually also has some overlaps with the question about public scholarship. Uh, and uh, Because public, so like going, giving lectures to the already converted who will be the ones that tune in is only one version of public scholarship. You know what I mean? Like basically the only people that listen to you when you're giving the public scholarship are the people who want to listen to it. So the, the issue of outreach and going out and starting in a more nuanced way with people who are actually out there trying to take education to them and what they want to learn, that actually is a form of scholarship. And it's a much more natural and decent, a morally decent form of scholarship than always saying, we're fantastic, you've got to come to us, and if you don't come to us, then we don't care about you. So, you know, and that I know has great resonance in Malaysia in terms of the underpinning philosophy, you know. Um, uh, and then the final one is, um, is the students with disabilities. You know, I think uh, the, the notion of information technology and adaptive technologies and so on um, for folks with disabilities is important. But just as important is what I was just saying about going out and listening and working with folks for co-creation around what would work for them. And that could become a very important and helpful capstone type project as part of your social enter enterprise projects, right? Is actually going out and working with those folks who have disabilities the very elderly as well as the very young, working out what might we be able to do to take out outreach, if you like, um, projects to you, or to make your participation with us better. So that notion of listen, link, leverage and lead works in many ways as, as a mechanism to guide the, fu the, the university of the future. Thank you, Rob. Good. All right, so I think we have come to the end of this session. Um, you know, like time flies when things are this good. So yeah, um, I'm sure if you, uh, it's done in face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, the participants will join me in in uh, in, uh, you know, in, in uh, showing our appreciation. Um, we are doing it online. Uh, so uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, fantastic uh, sharing, and um, I'm sure that the, the participants will be looking for all the um, the various. Uh, references that you've shared with us uh, on behalf of the um, of the organizing committee and GHEF uh, 2021. Again, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Scott. Absolutely, my pleasure. And uh, and let us not make this the end of a relationship, but just uh, something. So, you know, particularly if you can aggregate up any areas of interest into one person to contact me, then we can always actually start to look at some little projects together. You know, <laughs> it's always much better to say, why don't we, than why don't you. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you so much. Okay. Thank all you. right. Okay. Well, that's it's been great, and all the very best to everyone. So I'll I shall say farewell now to everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much to the moderator and keynote speaker for the very interesting sharing just now. All right. So uh, let's take a break before continuing with the second keynote presentation. Again, I would like to remind you that CPD points are awarded for the session. You can access the link in the chat box and the QR code will be displayed on screen for the participants. Now, the Malaysian time is 10.45 a.m. And we will meet again at 10.50 p.m. Malaysian time. So we'll take a five minutes break. Thank you very much. <laughs>